Uh, we've been uh, putting on some training for people, uh, employees, agency people for, from all across the Midwest, uh, from Wisconsin and uh, away from as far north as Wisconsin, far south as Tennessee, from Missouri. So uh, we've had a really good week. And, uh, you know, some of those folks aren't blessed with the kind of soil that we've got around here. You may have been, if you've done any traveling, you know, the, the folks in the southwest part of Missouri think this soil looks pretty good around here. Why would we need to worry about soil health, right? And uh, some of you may be thinking the same thing out there in, 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 the, in the audience. Uh, uh, I see some folks around that, that are sitting on some pretty darn good soil. So, uh, what are we going to talk about soil health? My goodness, we can... We may be looking at a record kind of a crop here this year again. We've got genetics that are fantastic and uh, yields have been on the on the climb. Uh, this thing's still ringing, isn't it? It is. Whoever the sound person is, it'd be great if we could get the, I don't, I might be able to look under there and, and see real quick. Or it's over here actually. Let's see if there's a volume right there. Okay. That might be a little better. Okay. Anyway, um, one of the students, you know, asked, says, my goodness, you know, if you've got really good soil and you've got a farmer that's, that's had some really good years and making quite a bit of money and everything's kind of going just right, what would you tell that farmer about soil health? What would be the important thing to tell them? And I guess... In the beginning, I would say that, you know, many of you have been to those, those meetings where they talk about how are we going to get a national average corn yield up to 300. And we're going to have these 9 billion people living on the world that not only want to eat, but drive vehicles and, and have electricity and things like that. And you've heard all those meetings where we've got to achieve this really high production level by as early as 2030, but 2030 to 2050, somewhere in there, I've heard different, different numbers. And I guess what I would suggest is that during really good or pretty sound economic times is the very best time to seek out efficiencies, seek out ways to take uh, production to new levels, to uh, uh, take care of water quality because in the end we every one of us have to please our end customer and 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 many of them are very concerned about the water they drink and the environment that they live in so uh, they they looking at they're looking today at every single thing that they buy at the grocery store and asking questions how was it how was it grown how was it manufactured how was it handled all through the process so it's times like this that I think we have somewhat of a luxury to seek out really the best technologies we can. And we're doing a really good job of that from an equipment standpoint, from a biological standpoint, and the genetics, and, and the bioengineering, and the chemistry uh, standpoint, to pro crop protection, and those kinds of things. Uh, however, much of that has been happening at a, a kind of a steady decline. We've, we've kind of been slowly but surely burning off our organic matter. We're, we're doing a lot of intensity. We've been you know, farming uh, with pretty intense me mechanical methods to that soil uh, for a very long time. And, and honestly, we probably could be seeing much steeper trend lines on our yield progression if we also had a very, very high functioning soil. And, and you know, as good as our soil is in this part of the world, I still believe it can be better. The reason I think it can be better, and each of you have seen it, if you've got a yield monitor on your combine and you've recently taken out a fence row, or you've recently brought in a little corner field that used to be a pasture or something like that, you see it on the, on the yield monitor. We used to call that rotational advance, but, but people talk about, well, that new, new field, that new farm that, that where it's, where it's recently been converted see what the production capability is where a soil still has diversity and still has more of its function more of its working organic matter and and so we've got some demonstrations here many of you have seen these and if you have not seen these we can't get our video cam to work so please come up just at least during this phase to look at this you're going to find it somewhat interesting i think 
But what we know is when we get to a point in agriculture where we're restoring organic matter, we're putting new reactive and active labile carbon back into the system and we're on a continuous build. We get organisms that are putting those polysaccharides back in and building aggregate stability. As we build aggregate stability to our soil, then it has a resilience to the pressures of water. In other words, when we get a two inch rain that comes in a half an hour, it can, it can withstand some of those forces. It also, by holding those aggregates together with those polysaccharides and those glues from the, from the uh, beneficial fungi like, like uh, uh, mycorrhiza, vascul uh, or vascular mycorrhiza, then, then you also have pore space. You have water holding capacity that was otherwise not as good. You have infiltration that's far better. Even under irrigation systems, we're seeing tremendous benefits to restoring that aggregate stability to get water into that soil. It's making our irrigation system so much more efficient. So this is a demonstration to take a look at two different, you know, same exact soil type. And we've got some other demonstrations we're going to do, but, but uh, two, two of the same soil types, side by side. The only thing that separates these two soils are management and a gravel road. With the same exact map unit, one's under a continuous long-term no-till system with cover crops. The other is under what we would call a conservation tillage system. I told the class this week, I said, you know, this field that I'm going to show side by side to the long-term continuous no-till, if, if, if it were highly erodible, we would say, as an agency, we would say it needs compliance. And, and that's a little disturbing in that when you see how these react in the soil. So, so what I, what I want to show is under this long-term no-till system, and these soils aren't inherently as good as what you have, okay? And so uh, we'll, we'll look at these, but this one is long-term continuous no-till with cover crops, okay? Now, I couldn't hold these together well enough uh, under the, the more conventional tillage, or it's actually conservation tillage that's literally right across the road. And I'll just walk around just a little, just so you can take a look. There's a visual difference to these soils too. You know, this is, this is 12 years of continuous snow-till plus six years of continuous cover crops. So it's had a continuous living root, <coughs> continuous cover. Erosion has been next to nil. Okay? And, and I, I say erosion, you know, we don't think a lot about erosion up here. Uh, many of you are, are at that tolerable soil loss. How many people have bought a farm recently? How many people have been to an auction where farms have been bought? <laughs> What's land selling for? Little bit, huh? Yeah. Over 10,000 in many cases in this part of the world, right? Over 12. What's your tolerable? If you just bought a, so, uh, bought a farm that, that for $14,000, what's your tolerable soil loss? How much are you willing to let go? Huh? What should be your tolerable soil loss? You know, as an agency, I'm a little bit embarrassed. You know, I said, you know, we've got for soils, most of the soils up here, we say the tolerable soil loss is five, five tons per acre per year. Not if I paid $12,000 an acre for it. My tolerable soil loss would be zero. Okay? And so this one's zebra. This one's losing about that. Five, six tons per acre. Okay? You can just visibly see kind of the difference in these soils. So let's just, just kind of see as the water, these are air dried. Come on up front. If you have not seen this, please get up and come on up. I mean, you're, 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 we're going to have a hard time showing this. If, if you don't want to, I'm not going to make it, but, but I would, uh, you, you, would, you would probably appreciate it. I'm going to drop these in here. At the, at the same time, and uh, this is the long-term continuous no-till. We'll just drop that down in there, and uh, I'm going to drop the uh, the conventional, more more conservation tillage in, in there. Okay. Now we see bubbles, air bubbles coming out. So the water is actually going in. A lot of air bubbles going in. So water is going in both of these. The big difference is 
that this one has enough organic matter in there to hold the soil particles together. As water goes into these claws, air pressure goes up. And this one can stand that raise in air pressure. Every time it rains on your farm, the same thing happens. This one obviously does not have the resistance to withstand that air pressure. And the soil is falling apart. I find it very disturbing that this is approved by NRCS basically as good conservation pillow system. It, 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 was, it was probably a compromise, would be my guess. I don't think that a lot of us out in the, uh, would, have, would have said that that would meet a, a good conservation system. However, how far are you going to go with something that's a national program? But uh, the, uh, the thing that, that we forget sometimes is as these soils break down, they lose those glues from, from reactive organic matter that you're building in the soil. This soil is mapped as it's a B slope, two to six percent slopes. And it has a number at the end of your soil series. What does that number usually mean if you've looked at a soil survey? It'll either have no number at the end, it'll have a two or a three. Most of you up in this part of the world have never seen a two or three on, on your soil survey. But the two is for moderate, moderately eroded. A three means severely eroded, okay? So this one is mapped as severely eroded. That's the map symbol that, that the soil scientists back in the 70s put on this. So the, the, the thing that I started out the discussion with is we have the ability to regenerate soil function. Ten years might seem like a long time to wait. How many of you have been renting a farm for, for over ten years? Same farm. We always think, well, you know, I'm, only, I'm renting this land. I, you know, I, I hate to invest too awful much there, but in most cases, we've got pretty good relationships with our landlords, and we're renting those. We've been renting those for for a long enough time that certainly the management practices, things like no-till and cover crops and things like that, could probably have already been paying back huge dividends to us if we would have done this. Hey, but Barry. You pick those two soils because they do this nicely. I bet you a whole bunch of soils don't do this, right? We'll see. We've got we've got a lot of clay soils here from from central Illinois. Here's here's a, a soil that where we were out of training this week um, down at uh, Attica, Dan De Sutter's farm, long-term no-till plus cover crops. Many of you know Dan. Uh, we picked up one of these while we were out there. Now I haven't completely air dried it, and honestly. I'm going to do something that I always tell all of, all of my folks, never ever do this in front of a crowd if you haven't tested it. <laughs> so I'm out there, okay? I, I know enough of you out there, you're kind of like fans, you know? So I feel like I can do it. And you'll probably yell at me and laugh at me if it goes wrong, right? So uh, this is uh, probably close to 15 or 20 years of continuous snow till. It's probably been cover crops. Pretty well continuous for the last uh, six, eight years would be my guess. It, was, it came from that field, uh, Dan Towery, that, that you and I were in with the annual ryegrass years ago. I don't know what year that was. I can't even remember, but it's been a while back. Okay, so we'll just we'll drop that in there and just see how that performs. Very high clay soil, uh, higher clay possibly than the others, but uh, has that reactive carbon has a new source of carbon coming into it and so you know when we show this to folks policy makers we show this to non-farm people they get a quick look at which which soil would they like their water to be filtered through as it comes through the rain and through across the landscape and, and makes it into the lakes and streams and ultimately into the drinking water and uh it's kind of obvious, to them at least, which one. Now, Hans, you brought some from... Yeah, I think, you know, Indiana soil's not as good. The guys in Illinois have these wonderful <laughs> soils. Now, the top crops, I bet you don't work in there. They have blood and high organic matter. Yeah. So, uh, let's try that. So, here's an Illinois soil. Across the road from each other. Management is the only difference. See, 
is not as dramatic as our Indiana soils. You see they, that they're both taking up water. One of them is falling apart faster than the other one. I'll let you decide in a bit which one was the no-till here. Now the interesting thing is a lot of people say, well you guys are fibbing this stuff. You put Elmer's glue on this one plot and so it won't fall apart. So it's okay to take it up? Or, or this one of Dan's. Yep. It's been in there the least amount of time. So take that out and then break it open. Now the fact that that plot is still hanging together as a plot in itself. Yeah, don't, don't confuse a quad with yeah, an aggregate. So far. Okay. Right. Now, I'm, I'm originally from French Lake, Indiana. I'm oh, sorry. And, and we farm a soil called Zanesville. You know, it's red, hilltops. And I was the guy that got to drive the disc. And our soils, we would work it and work it and work it. And we'd start getting it down to a softball size. Then we'd get it down to a baseball size. And then the third disc, we'd get it down to about a golf ball size. And that's how we knew it was time to plant. <laughs> so water would not go in those at all. But take a look at this one right here. It's totally wet all the way. Water all the way to the core of that fast. That's how quick it took. So it's not like it's falling apart. apart. It's not like it's withstanding water from coming in. It's actually letting water in even faster uh, because of that aggregate stability, that pore space that's in that soil. Okay. So. Uh, The other thing that happens, you know, even if I bust this apart, see these pieces falling? Are they clouding up the water? Those microaggregates are still uh, holding together. That's still uh, 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 not a dense thing. That's, that's almost hollow. There's, there's nutrients stored inside. There's water stored inside. When it hits the bottom, it looks more like cottage cheese. This looks on the bottom like you could take, it, take a knife in there and spread it on a sandwich and hand it to somebody and they think it's peanut butter. Right? And so when that does dry out on the soil surface, that's what gives us that crusting that, that, that keeps that soil from, you know, the second rain is actually worse. Okay. I think Hans's uh, soil here from Illinois. It's not doing much. It's not doing much. So <laughs> six, and a half, six, six and a half percent organic matter. We might have pulled both of them out of the one bag. I'm not sure. <laughs> Sometimes uh, okay. we, we assist each other too much. So uh, one thing one thing that that I want to point out is you know here's these soils in an aggregate stability test uh, showing the forces of water. We take it when we collect these samples. We take enough to go ahead and fill a bucket and then air dry it and then put it in here. Now both are now somewhat disturbed. Okay, you can't just pull it out and air dry it, put it in a bucket and not disturb it just a little bit. So it has been slightly disturbed. Uh, but we put it in into this uh, tube, it's high tech. This is actually a yarn jar for those uh, crocheting enthusiasts out there. Uh, they, we've got holes all the way across the bottom uh, that, that will let water out. And uh, we're going to simulate a really fast, hard rainfall here in just a second. We want to take a look at what happens to these soils. What is the resilience factor of these soils when we get those two inch rains? Oh. So it's highly technical. Uh, I'll let Hans do the no-till one. Uh, it, 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 we have to measure these pretty quickly and, and, and sometimes we have to travel all over to get devices, you know, get our equipment put together for these, for these uh, demonstrations. We fill the water up to uh, nobody knows me. Now, we tried it at I'm feeling sexy, that wasn't enough, and uh, no problemo was way too much, okay? So, so uh, we, we have to use precise measures on these, but we're going to simulate rainfall of the same exact two soils that we, we pulled. Oops. Now, I should probably come around and, and, and take a look here. Make sure that the, the, the thing is working. We took it out, disturbed it a little bit, tamped around the edges so we cut down on preferential flow. So, so we've kind of tamped this in here, but we'll take a look at the infiltration rate of some of these soils here in just a second. Already we can see the same thing that happened on this side. See how the water's clouded up? Immediately from the rainfall splash and things, the water has already clouded up. When you get water clouding up after rain, what's, what's in that cloudy water? 
Huh? Soil particles, clay particles. What's unique about those clay particles at the surface of the soil? What, what they got in them? That's where a lot of your nutrition is held. It's also where some of your fertilizers are bound, bound up. That's where some of your uh, uh, herbicides are, some of your insecticides are. They, they attach to clay particles. So, you know, even on relatively flat soil here, uh, how many people after a one-inch rain drive down the field, drive down the road, and find areas of fields that are standing full of water, that are pooled up, pocketed up? You see that every once in a while. You know, you get a half an inch or an inch, inch let's say an inch of rain, but the pools aren't an inch, right? They're a couple of feet deep in those low spots in the soil. So, on, on relatively really flat soil, on an inch rain. That, that soil, that water cannot get in there. And, and then when it does, it, it runs off, takes those chemicals, takes those fertility, takes our fertility to one part of the field that is lower than the rest. What's usually in that lower part of the field? What kind of mechanical device do we usually have there? Usually a riser right there, right? So where's this water then going? Right down the tube. And right out the tile line, right into the open ditch and on its way to the Gulf of Mexico. Okay? For some reason, those folks in the Gulf do not appreciate it sending all those nutrients to them. I don't understand. It seems like they really appreciate it. But they don't. And we bought those. They, we bought all that fertilizer. We would really like to keep it on the land. But if it's on that surface, that's the richest part of the, of the soil, is that that's closest to the surface. And so, uh, it's very important also, in years like this, did we get some rain this spring? Got just a little bit, right? If you get that rain in the spring, and it, more of it goes in the soil, and then you also have an ability to hold, you, that aggregate stability gets you a higher water holding capacity to the soil, then when it turns off dry in times like this, and you now have those, those uh, uh, root channels that are intact from the, the cover crops and the long-term notes, the roots can get down to that water that's, that's stored deep into the soil profile. You get to use it. It's like having an extra inch of rain Very that time nice. of year. Dribbling out the bottom now, the nose So this one's already moved through. Now, I'll, I'll take this around because this is what a... Uh, remember, I didn't say this was just beat to a ball. This is conservation tillage. We would call this controversial tillage. So, you take this around and look at this. I, I, I'm relatively confident that, that I won't spill any on anybody. Okay? I, I just got that view. I'm going to take a chance. Um, what would this mean to the folks downstream if, they, if, if, if you could actually store more water in, in the soil up here? What would it mean right now if we had an extra inch of water stored in our soil profile? So I think even really good soil that we've got in this part of the world can be made better. We can restore some of the function. I think there's potential to make it better. And that's where what it's going to take. Uh, uh, I've heard numerous corn specialists that's talking about how do we get to 300 bushel yield. What's the number one thing that they say is going to be lacking as we strive to get 300 bushels? What? It takes a lot of water. And, and we just are not going to be able to sprinkle all the water on. We'll talk about why that's not as efficient later. But we can try. I mean, we can try to irrigate as much as we can. But I'm telling you, the folks in Nebraska are already getting pinched by how much water they'll let them use. So we've got to find a way to store it more and deliver it more efficiently through our soil system. Yeah, but very, you fill all those things up. So I want to see what happens when it really is in the field. And since we're not taking you out to the field, for years I worked with rain simulators and uh, sprinkled actually pretty natural looking rainfall on fields to see what would happen, no-till versus conventional. In order to bring it to you, we use a little simulator that has basically these bread pans without a bottom. We drove them into the soil surface and we have those sitting here with the soils on there so they are totally undisturbed. We just pulled them out of the fields as they're sitting here for you. 
And again, this is that same soil, right, Barry? This is across the gravel road from each other. What is the soil type on this one? That's it's, Miami, right? It, it's a Miami. So again, long-term no-till with cover crops and a field right next to it where we have a conservation sort of system. And you see, you see some residue. There's, there's almost 30 percent residue. Right. There. Now we're going to do this very scientific. We have this device here that creates a very natural rainfall pattern for you. Some of it with holes in the bottom. So this is even. This is not coming from high, great height, and great force like our rain usually does here in Indiana. It's not even going sideways like the rain is always going here. So let's see what happens. If you have not seen this little rain simulator, again, I invite you to come up. It's kind of hard to see from the back and it goes very quickly. So if you haven't seen this, you want to come up, feel free to do that. We haven't bitten anyone for a number of years now, so you stay for a beer. Well, it does. The, the, the more, more tilts one is laying a little flatter, so it's actually a flatter slope, but we'll let it, we'll let it go just, just the same. Okay. Thunder, lightning. Boom, 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 crash. Here it comes. <laughs> so, hey, we have no, we have uh, runoff from both of them. How can that be there? Well, I saw it. It's supposed to take in all this water, right? Yeah, I saturated them both, so we'll we'll see how it goes uh, as, as as the rain comes down. Yeah, I've, I've taken them right out of the field, and sometimes all the water will go into the no-till, and none of it will run off. While on the tilt one, even if it's bone dry, that soil will slake over or crust over very rapidly. And I've done close to 300 of these kind of demonstrations in the field in situations like this. I've yet to find a soil type on three continents by now that doesn't do this. Whether you have very sandy soil, whether you have a high clay soil, whether it's very little slope, a lot of slope, if the soil is not protected, if a lot of tillage has occurred, that soil will seal over with even as little raindrops falling about four inches. If you have good soil cover, you don't do a lot of tillage on those soils, the water actually will go in and the water that runs off is clear, as you can tell. You start it with this clear water. This is what came off of it. And, and that one's laying... Would you drink this? Would you drink this? That was laying extremely flat. It's actually flatter than the, the, the no-till one over there, the way we've got it set up. Right. Uh, the other thing, that to get these done, I mean, how many people could go out there right now in their soil and, and, and get this into the ground? So I, I have to be honest, I had to put a... a uh, a little bit of water on these right. to get it soft enough so that I could get these in. So these are both pretty, you know, they've got water in them. It's not like they're both bone dry. So the amount of water we put on was what goes to this rim in this little bucket that got it. So virtually all the water ran off the, the till soil. On the no-till where we had quite a bit of runoff, a lot less ran off, even though these are both saturated. So there is a difference, and that difference is right below here. It went through that no-till, and it ended up in the pan underneath. Can you show me that there, that pan? So the difference of the water is right there. It went through the soil, where it was filtered, and didn't go into the stream right away. But again, this is my answer. I get the big difference is, you know, we've, we've got pore space here that's going to let water go in. Uh, we've done this several times and the water holding capacity of that soil, we can, we can measure that also uh, if we start with dry soil. So our colleague Ben Perkins from Rensselaer brought in some very sandy soils for us. This is a Rensselaer loamy sand. And so you, you rain on the sand and the water's going to go right in because it's going to fall right through, right? So it doesn't matter where you till it's on the sandy soil. Right? Okay. Let's try it. And then this one is soaking wet, we said, right? It had four inches of rain. It had four inches of rain already. Okay. Put a rainmaker, man. If I could make it rain this much down in Greencastle, Indiana, I'd be tickled. You know, when I started doing rainfall simulator demonstrations was in 1993. 
that was not a good year to be running around with a machine that said in big letters on the back, rain simulator, that 1993 year of the floods. I learned all the American sign language within a month. <laughs> Now then, this thing is all saturated. How come the water is still going through? Did you fit with these things? Oh, that's Okay. <laughs> so again, you see the very same picture here. We have, uh, again, those bottles hold exactly the amount of water to fill these bins up to the little edge. And we can see now that we have filled soil. Virtually all the water that came from this bottle came off the top. The whole bottom of this thing is filled with uh, soil. Actually, by now it's dirt. It's not soil anymore. The no-till, hey, what's the story? How long was the no-till? Ten-year no-till? Any cover crops on there? Not even cover crops. They were taking crops for road from each other. Again, same soil depth, same landscape position. The difference is management and gravel road in between. No, virtually no soil in here, very sandy soil. We actually took the big rain simulator out to uh, this farm uh, two years ago, I think, and we took the uh, work soil and we just clipped off the cover crop on one of the fields they had, put the rain in there within 60 seconds. It was very dry, very dry. It was just before corn harvest, October 12th, it was, I think. Put the machine on there within 60 seconds. That one soil where we didn't have cover from there was completely sealed over and started running off. Dry, sandy, long sand soil. 60 seconds to get full runoff at a rate of about two inches an hour. Very common for us here in Indiana. <coughs> Again, the soil is going, the water is running through on this one. This soil is dribbling. We have water coming through. On the tilt one, no water came through into the bin. Just to saturate it, the water cannot get through there. That's one of our issues we have with a lot of our soils. The water just can't get in. The worst scenario I've ever seen was in Kansas. We had a huge rain simulator, a 50 foot diameter machine that we pulled on the big trailer. Wind erosion was occurring when I showed up in this field. It was nasty to set up this machine. We had sand blown about yay high into the ground. If you've ever been in wind erosion in the sandy soil, it's a lot of fun if you need to work in there. You know about that, Dan. So I thought it was going to look like a full lap. 50 farmers coming looking at me. I can put on two and a half inches of water on the ground with this machine. The soil survey tells me that the percolation rate in the soil is six inches. We <coughs> put up the machine, we start it up just like this sandy soil. One quarter inch of rain, about six minutes, we had full runoff from that pot that had no protection on it, where we had residue on it that had been a no-till. We put three and a half inches of water in there. We had the machine running for over an hour and a half. Water was still going in, no runoff. On the other one, it ran off after a quarter inch. Big, big difference how we manage our soils, what happened. Uh, we've got, uh, Betsy and I have a good friend that we work with down in uh, Knox County, Indiana, that gets to farm a lot of floodplains. And uh, we get reports from him every time we get about an inch of rain up here in the Wabash drainage area. And, and for some reason, he thinks that we ought to be able to keep all of our water up here because he doesn't like having corn under about six feet of water. And, and I really complain about the tires and the refrigerator. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's all the other devices that float in with it. But, um, you know, a lot of us would say that the reason to till the soil, how many people have gone out, if it's crusted up soil, you go out and you till it up to get so the water will go in, right? I mean, that's, that would be intuitive to us, that we've got the soil fluffed up so the water will go in. What we're forgetting is that raindrop in impact. And even on very, very flat land, we have erosion. We have erosion even in the, the higher organic soils on very flat land. But the erosion that we forget is the first erosion that happens in a rainstorm is straight down. And as, that, as those particles break into small pieces, they, they go straight down through the soil profile until they find a spot that they can't get through and they start plugging it up. And that happens very, very rapidly in a one or two inch rain, just like we just demonstrated here. The very first, even on flat soil, the very first erosion that happens is straight down, plugging up all those pore spaces so the water can't get into your soil profile, you can't store it. And then even on flat landscapes, it's going to run off somewhere. It's going to wind up someplace. It's going to find that low spot in the field, 
that has a tile under it or a riser coming out to the surface. And when that happens, the entire Wabash drainage area, in many cases, if, if you're east of here, it, it's going on to, to Lake Erie, but it goes out in a pretty rapid fashion and it's heading to, to uh, the, the southwest part of the state and the United States down into those Mississippi River bottoms, and, and that's where the flooding occurs. If we could store that extra inch of water out of each of those storms, if we could store it in our soil, it would increase our production, we have to. If we could store that for, for later in the summer, and, and it would increase our production, but it would also save a lot of production um, in, in a lot of the, the corn belt that, that exists in many of these more floodplain situations. The berries, we're trying to get rid of water off because always it's wet. Harvest time, we always start drinking about when you pull the combine out of the barn, even in 2012 that happened. And uh, at planting time, it's always too wet in the end. So what are we going to do? Now you tell me, where do you want to drive your combine do you, or your planter? you want to drive it on this stuff? Or you want to drive on this stuff. Actually, <coughs> pull that water up. This is mainly laying on the bottom of this tube right now. This soil, your grandparents' soil, one with the higher organic matter, can stand a lot more traffic pressure. We're talking about having more compaction right now that is mainly to the degradation of our soils. Our soils are not as good. When your grandfather, your great grandfather had these soils with the higher organic matter content, if he had the bigger gear that we have right now, wouldn't get near the compaction on those soils that we get, even if it's wet out there. So it's not just that the gear has gotten bigger and we get more compaction on these soils. We know a lot of farmers can get on these soils a little earlier in the spring on these no-till soils. They drain better, and even if they're wet, they can already dry them. Okay, we've been talking in here for quite a bit. Any, any comments or questions on any of this? Does this make sense to you? Any, any comments? I mean, there's not near enough coffee. You know, Hans and I have been around the circuit. We got pretty thick skin. We can we can take it if we if you want. Somebody wants to call BS on us. Right, hold on. Let me get you back here. I have a question for you. I'm uh, Jeff Frazier. Uh, four years ago, I did a federal project, Sarah project, with what you did there. But we power water discharge from tile line, and it was interesting. I'm gonna get to your question. The tile line discharge. Phosphorus succeeded in what would have been legal. Uh, technically, if the farm was working on factory standards, it would be shut down. Of course, we're in Grand Lake St. Mary's, which is a mess of them. My question is, if applied for another federal grant, I'm hopeful to get CIG grant. CIG grant. What I'm hoping to prove, and I want your opinion if you think this is going to prove to be valid or not, that a tile system working with living soil consistently utilizing cover crops works more effectively, more efficiently with the cover crops because my contention is that with the dead dirt, the water is passing so quickly, taking nutrients with it, discharging, we're drying, but we're also incredibly more dry as we come to the fall period, whereas the living soil, she's going to absorb like a show, but then later on she's going to get banged and come back up. And then we're going to find, at least it's going to cut through with the CIG grant, that when you use a good tiling system with living soil, you will get better utilization of your tile and better utilization of water. Uh, give me an opinion. We're going to find it. What do you think we're going to find that? I'll talk first and then Hans jump in. We, we, we need some data to, to, to put this system together because my hypothesis is what yours is. If I have a continuous living root and a continuous living biological system, as you add diversity to the soil biology system, it becomes redundant. Okay, so as one living organism, whether it's a crop or whatever, gives up its nutrients as it dies off. There's always something else that's ready to, to take it. Soluble phosphorus would be the same thing. Certainly, we found that Eileen Kladivko will probably talk later. I don't know if she's going to talk about her study or not, but uh, we found that in nitrate, that it may be no-till by itself or just conservation tillage by itself can't trap all of those soluble nutrients because there's really nothing it, it, our, our, our diversity is not redundant enough. So if we have a continuous living root where as soon as the crop starts to die off, you have a cover crop there ready and waiting to take those soluble nutrients up into those systems. And as you have living roots 
that also diversifies the, the other microbes that live in the soil that also utilize these same nutrients. And so your cycling stays, stays constant instead of a crash and burn kind of thing. Uses it, uses it, it's done with it, and then releases it. Because most of our highly productive cropland is going to have tile. The question is, how do we keep all those nutrients in place and in play? You know, Brad Jordan uses the term, I think you can keep this in play, all of our soluble nutrients, keep them in play if we come closer to having a continuous living root in the system. So I, I'm very positive toward what your outcome will be. It'll be very interesting. Yeah, I think there's two parts to this whole thing. Number one, how do the nutrients go on? If we apply them to the surface in the fall, and we let them lay there with a lot of winter rains and stuff, you know a lot of them won't go into the soil. We know from long, long-term university data that incorporating nutrients is a better deal. If you knife in or deep place with the planter, your, your, uh, your phosphorus, your nitrogen, there's a lot less chance of it actually going into the water system. The study Barry is talking about uh, at uh, Butlerville is a drainage study that I leaned in and the year they started planting cover crops, they plant a cover crop every other year, the amount of nitrogen coming out of the tile drains just started dropping. Same thing in the Chesapeake Bay. They use a lot of cereal rye on those fields for the same reason. Get that nitrogen coming off those fields, either off the surface or off out of the tile going down and it works wonderfully well. These cover crops can actually hang on to these, uh, these nutrients very long time. We're very surprised about some of these results. So don't count on them being available for your next crop right away, but they will be still in your soil in the bank account you're building up while you build organic matter. Even the radishes. Radishes can take up an enormous amount of nitrogen out of the soil, especially if you plant them after wheat and manure has been applied found as much as 250 pounds of nitrogen taken up by those radishes by the end of their growing season, both in the tops and the bottoms. More moderate amounts will get taken up if you plant them right after corn or soybeans or you've flown them in. And some recent data from Illinois shows that these radishes, as they rot and as they freeze out, they do not immediately release that nitrogen. It goes in the soil in an organic form. It is not washing out. By June or July is when that organic nitrogen from those radishes is broken down enough it starts releasing it. What is happening in the field in June or July? Your corn is looking very hard for a lot of nitrogen. So it's perfect. You have something that freezes out in the fall and not release that nitrogen in a useful form, in a mineralized form, until June or July. So yes, these cover crops do wonders. They work very well. But the flip side, especially in the Grand Lake area, is that a lot of the Phosphorus will have to go into the soil rather than be on top of the soil, which means we'll probably have to start knifing in fertilizer and uh, watch the rates we're putting on. Yeah, and, and absolutely, the low hanging fruit there is we've got to stop putting phosphorus on frozen ground. You know, I know, I know that intuitively I've probably been guilty years ago before we realized the phosphorus issue. I probably might have said to him, though, Tiller, you know, you won't put the soil near as much if you're out there when it's, when it's, when it's, got, when it's frozen. Uh, however, anymore it seems like, yeah, it's frozen part of the winter, but uh, we may have already applied that on frozen ground and come back and uh, we get uh, mid-January two-inch rain. And it's still frozen underneath, but it's a rain and it runs off. And guess what? We lost a lot of what we just paid good money for. Okay, so the other advantage of these cover crops is, you know, it's, it builds that bank again. And, and as that organic, once it takes up the nitrogen and phosphorus organically and holds it, and then starts releasing it this time of year, how better could you be spoon feeding some nutrients back to that crop? You know, if we get a rain after that and it's breaking down, that's a spoon feeding way to, to add another whole path of, of, of uptake for that crop to get at some nutrients, some late nutrients. We're seeing that that's very, very advantageous in, as we try to achieve really high soybean yield. Because you know, beans this time of year in this kind of heat will actually stop shut, stop making it some of its own nitrogen. So we kind of need that organic form to start giving it up for, for that additional nitrogen for the soybeans to finish. We shouldn't let you ask questions because you know the answers, Dan, but go for it. Well, these, these really aren't my questions. I have a number of farmers who you know, farm corn after corn, have a lot of residue, and they say they have to do at least some sort of breaking of residue and like 
sense is, well, put a cover crop in there and you know your biology will break down the rest of the What what are people finding? Is that true or is it not? I heard Dan the Soda's farm this week, he complains about not having enough residue. And he's continuous corn, no till. He's complaining about not having enough residue. He's continuous corn and cover crops and no till and he wished he had more residue out there. He is using some manure that adds that extra biological and nutrient component that, that is beneficial. He has other strategies. He uses a corn head that pinches that stalk and breaks that stalk every two inches so that it is a, a, does have an infection site. I mean, there's other ways to do this other than just tilling the soil. And, and so there is a total strategy to, to keeping the biological process going there. Uh, when a continuous corn farmer tells me they're having trouble keeping stalks, enough stalks around to keep the soil covered, we walked out into no-till fields and, and it's hard to find enough residue. You wouldn't believe really that it was a no-till situation if we didn't know how, how we did this system. And it's mainly because we got a biology boosted up so much and one of the big critters taking an enormous amount of corn residue in the ground to our farms. And they, they just pull entire leaves into their bare burrows and, and they do year in, year out most of the year if the temperatures are okay so they take a lot of those residues away from the fields I, I use the triple stack corn for quite a while at home it's a corn bean rotation but uh, honestly on some of the sloping land down there around the green uh, green castle uh, it, we struggle to keep it a continuous no-till system with cover crops we struggle to keep enough residue to provide the erosion control so we've actually started increasing the amount of carbon type cover crops to keep more around so we have better erosion control. So uh, uh, it's the biology that'll break down the corn stalks. It, 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 they're, they're not, you know, uh, it, there's nothing magical about it. it, it it's the, it's the, the, the fungus and, and the microbes and those things that are gonna break down the corn stalks. Where does the fence post rot? Right, right at the soil surface right there. So, so if you have your corn head, fixed so it's gonna, gonna, gonna at least pinch those and get that down. Uh, corn, stalks, corn stalks aren't hard to get rid of in a continuous no-till system when you have such an increase in your soil biology. So, I think that the issue is with people switching to no-till. You've been in a tilt situation for a long time, you quit tilling now, and those first couple of years, yes, you will have a buildup of residue, because your biology is cranking in your soil, yeah, and your production is very high, and you're not working them into the ground. The interesting thing is when you work residue into the ground, we talked, we listened earlier this week to some, some microbiologists that said actually by working your residue in the ground, you take it away from the primary guys that take it into the soil. The earthworms, the beetles, the guys that get to chomp it up and get it in littler pieces in the ground so the microbes can get to it better. So it's basically counterintuitive. I've done some experiments in Kansas where we did tillage, and after two years of tillage, we got old residue coming back up. It had been in the soil for two years, and it wasn't totally rotten yet was the right microbes and the right soil critters to get to them. In nature, it's an ordered system. The big guys, the, be the beetles and all that, chomp it down on the soil surface, pull it in their barrels in the soil where the smaller critters can get to it that can't chomp it down at that level. Now, if we put those big chunks into the ground, the things that are living in the ground at that level don't have the tools to break it down in those smaller parts, and you have to wait for it slowly to deteriorate the fungi and bacteria. We're well, out of time, aren't we? Yeah, I've got a few stops. We'll keep this, this transition nicely. We've, we started talking some about some of the cover crops and things. And we've got some people uh, trying cover crops, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. I've got a couple of slides, uh, if I could get things going here. Um, And jump in any time if something comes up that, that doesn't make sense to you. I'm going to try to go through these relatively quick, but we had some issues about timing of, of, of termination of cover crops. And there's a real strategy here, but when it comes to managing cover crops, it's kind of like anything, but it's, it's kind of like we're in basketball country, so it's kind of like being a really good basketball coach. You know, a really good basketball coach will be twofold. They'll have a tremendous game plan. You know, many of us as farmers, we've got a really good game plan going into the spring. We've got it all, got the seed all bought, and herbicides lined up and everything figured out. We've got a really good game plan. Same thing with managing cover crops and things like that. 
if you've got a really good game plan, that's you should have. But in basketball, as soon as the ball goes up, the game plan may be all off because that team may have come out with a totally different defense than you watched on film. Okay? So as a farmer, Mother Nature may, as soon as the ball goes up, Mother Nature may hand you a whole different kind of a climate or weather forecast or, or condition that you weren't prepared for. So you've got to be a game time coach. You've got to be somebody that can make those decisions rapidly and make have enough of an understanding of the management and the goals that you're trying to accomplish with these things to make some quick changes. And a lot of that has to do with how would you change how you terminate that cover crop or when you terminate it and, and then how maybe you set your plan or things. So I wanted to talk about some of those things real quick just to kind of give us a, uh, a, an idea how we would manage that. Uh, uh, cover crops, first of all, have to be a part of your total package. Uh, we talk a lot about continuous no-till, but it's not just the absence of tillage that we're talking about. We're talking about a quality no-till system. We are managing every aspect for no-till. Everything's geared around no-till. Okay, you've got a planter that is absolutely set to optimize no-till. You're going to control your traffic because you're not fixing surface compaction with tillage. So you've got to be very cognizant how you drive, how you operate, all of these things in a quality no-till system. You're going to probably have to change your nutrient management system to cater to a no-till. If you don't change your nutrient management when you switch to a no-till system or a strip-till system, if you don't change your nutrient management, your time, your rate, your, your position, your, your, uh, your formulations are probably going to need to change to optimize the no-till system. Okay, so it's an adaptive advanced no-till uh, uh, nutrient management system. So as we incorporate cover crops into this system, you can't just go say, well, I'm going to plant a cover crop. Uh, I hope somebody, you know, let's go spread it, you know, and, and put it on. you got to have a strategy. That cover crop needs to complement your nutrient management system that has already been catered to optimize the no-till system. Okay? So, so you're going to get everything working together so that the whole is far greater than the sum of its parts. All of this has to be, of course, incorporated into your crop rotation. You've got to know which of these cover crops are going to be best ahead of corn and which ones are going to be ahead of beans. And if you've got wheat in the rotation, what can you utilize wheat to do to really enhance the cover crop that can also enhance your nutrient management and enhance your no-till system? See how it all starts working together. The good news is, if you tried no-till 20 years ago, you didn't have the advanced technologies that we have today that makes this system work so much better. Okay, this is, you know, Hans said, this is not your grandfather's soil that you're farming anymore. Well, this isn't the no-till system that you tried 20 years ago either. This is not your, you know, that, that commercial, it's not your father's Oldsmobile. Oldsmobile went by the wayside, so I don't know how that, what story that would tie that together, but, but I, hope, I hope that doesn't go the same far. But as we combine all these things together, the whole of the system is far, far exceeds the sum of its parts because everything is complementing everything. We inherently do that with most of our agriculture because we've grown up with it. Most of us didn't grow up with a, a no-till system. Didn't grow up planting cover crops or integrating, integrating cover crops. Okay, so, so we have to make some changes. And, and so that, that's how we have to manage this system. The key thing that we've talked about here today is, is introducing some microbial and soil diversity. Okay? Add that redundance to the system that keeps, keeps nutrients cycling and water cycling better throughout a wider range of conditions. We spend a lot of time in agriculture and there's a new program at the Fertilizer Institute that some of those folks are working on called the 4 R's. Anybody tell me what the four R's are? I just said them just a minute ago. When you're managing fertilizer, you want to put it on the right rate, the right place, the right time, and the right formulation, right? The right. That has to be the right management system because there's four rights involved, right? So how could it be wrong? <laughs> well, it is. It's a very, very important thing that we need to be thinking about every single time we put fertilizer out there. Why do we worry so much about the right time, right place, right, right formulation? Because it's, it, we're creating a single pathway, trying to get more of it to the crop. Okay? 
So it's very important that we get it there as efficiently as possible. It's a single pathway. It's coming through a tube, a hose, or a culture. We're trying to get it there. Okay? So that's one single pathway. If that pathway is cut off, how many people side vest nitrogen? If you were a little further south of here, you were getting some rains, but south of here, if you side vest nitrogen last summer, did any of that nitrogen ever get to the crop? It did not. Because you side dressed nitrogen, it was already starting to turn to dust and it continued to turn to dust. And I don't think a root ever, ever hit that nitrogen band. So that single pathway was cut off. As we build a diverse system, we're creating multiple pathways for that crop to get at the resources that it needs. And I'll continue on here in a minute, but, but by creating alternate pathways, then whatever Mother Nature gives you, this is an automatic game time coaching move that, that, that prepares your, your crop to, to get at the, the resources and, and, and to you know, manage the defense uh, the best it can. And so you're going you're gonna to create alternate pathways for it to get at the water, the nutrients, and the things that that crop needs. Okay? So that's very important and that's really at the crux of what we're talking about. Okay? Um, there's a difference between soil quality and soil health from my perspective. Soil quality is a place in time. That's high soil quality. Okay? And you saw what high soil quality does. This is not so high soil quality. And you saw what that soil quality does. It's a place in time. When we start talking about soil health, it's a continuing process. It's not a place in time, but it's a journey of constant improvement. The day that you stop, the day that we pull the soil out of its environment, and shook it up, put it in a bucket, carried it in here, and put it in a, in a canister, we stopped the process of soil health. We still had our re residual soil quality. Soil health has to be a continuing process. It's living organisms, and you're continually building redundancy through those, through those living organisms. And so consequently, that function is constantly improving. Okay, so that's, the, that's kind of the difference when we talk about soil health. In the end, we need to find a way to build resilience into our cropping system. Okay? Having high soil quality will carry us a long way. Having high soil health will build us resilience and build those multiple pathways to a wide ranging climatic situations and weather conditions and, and, and other extremes that can happen to us. So why cover crops? Why would, we, why would we on this beautiful soil up here, why would we even think about planting cover crops? Okay? Well, even though we've got pretty high soil organic matter, it's still all about the carbon. And so, if we're going to build carbon in our soil, if we're going to increase, we're going to be on that continuum of increasing reactive soil carbon in our soil, then first, we've got to put more in. We've got to use the free sunlight energy to capture that capture those, that sunlight in those months that otherwise we weren't growing anything. Our crop will start, start turning any day down here in some, in some parts of the state. It'll start turning and when it does, it, the, the capture of sunlight is over. We've still got a good three months in many cases to continue capturing sunlight and probably a couple of months in the spring that we can be growing organic matter, storing those carbohydrates, storing that carbon in the soil. Okay? And it will grow, roots will grow through the winter months when there's moisture much deeper and more, much more prolific. Most plants have a storage mechanism, a survival mechanism, that they store more stuff in their roots to get through the winter. Those are the kind of plants we're using for cover crops. So it's a whole different kind of plant that we're growing, which adds more diversity, that adds more carbon deeper into the soil profile. But no matter what we do, if we plant cover crops, we still have to think think about losing less to the atmosphere. Because every time we run a field cultivator or a tillage pass through that field in the spring of the year and inject oxygen, we're getting a flush of CO2. That's carbon dioxide that's leaving. It's going up into the atmosphere. It's releasing some other nutrients to us. We're mining off some, some, some nutrients that are actually available for that crop that year, but it's at the expense of that CO2. And the bottom line is, we can't probably grow enough to compensate for what we're losing in our tillage operations, okay? In a corn bean rotation, you just can't grow enough, even with a cover crop, to compensate for the amount that we would lose to the atmosphere. You can't starve your way to soil health, though. 
I don't want to lead you down a path that says you get your health, soil health, and, and you, you start down there and plant these cover crops, and the very next year you're ready to cut your fertilizer rates in half. Okay? I'm not, I'm not ready to say that. Production is too important for us, and I don't want anybody to crash and burn. I also know that if I'm going to build organic matter, if that's my goal, to, my goal is to build organic matter, there's a correlating amount of nitrogen that you've got to have in order to build that organic matter. Why is that? Why would building organic matter need nitrogen? What, what's in the meat? If we're going to grow something, I need somebody that's growing livestock. If you're going to grow something, what you've got to, what you've got to have? You've got to have protein, right? You've got to have water, but you've got to have protein. And what's in protein? Amino acids? What's in amino acids? Nitrogen, right? So, where's the best place to get that nitrogen? We're gonna, we're gonna go buy some more nitrogen? Uh, or fertilizer, folks would love you if we did. But, my first place to buy that nitrogen, or get that nitrogen, is the nitrogen I already bought, that was otherwise gonna leave. We've got study after study that shows over most of our tiled cropland, we're losing 50 to 70 pounds of nitrogen each and every year, even if there's no fall of nitrogen applied. We lose just mineralizing out of the organic matter. We're losing 50 to 70 pounds of nitrogen that's otherwise going to leave. That's just part of the system. It's leaking. Okay? What if we could capture that 50 to 70 pounds and use that as a building block of more organic matter to do a cover crop? What if that was the source of nitrogen we were using? We sort of already paid for it, but we were going to lose it. So we might as well get it, and it's somewhat free that way, and we can use that to build that new building block block of protein to build organic matter. Okay? If you're going to have a healthy herd of cattle, you've got to have a healthy forage. Okay? Well, a healthy soil can also grow you a healthy herd of, of a livestock working for you under the soil, but it takes protein. It takes, takes, takes some nutrient to get that done. You'll have about the same weight under your feet as you will over your feet in a healthy, healthy uh, grazing system. I would suggest the same thing is true in a healthy cropping system. You would still have a good 2,000 pounds right under your feet of, of very, very active uh, microbes and, and living organisms. Okay? You've got to feed your herd. Feed your un herd under the, under the soil. Absolutely cannot mine organic matter. And the most important part of this is that water holding capacity. Each percent of organic matter, we're talking about that acre for a slice that you take when you do soil sampling. One of the most important parts of that is that extra extra percent of organic matter can hold you an extra up to an inch, inch of water that's available to that crop. And everybody, about this time of year, if you're growing soybeans, if you're really chasing that really high soybean yield, what would you really like to have about right now? An inch of water. Give me an inch of water, and I can actually put another five bushes per acre, maybe even a ten bushes per acre out there. So that's real economics. Okay. What we're really trying to do is create those alternate pathways. Uh, okay? We're going to build organic matter, having a matter of these roots and these organisms and these things living right here, helping you fix nitrogen, add biology to the soil, add water holding capacity right up here at the surface is very important. And in no-till even, we see that. We see a little organic matter build right at the surface in, in just straight no-till. However, when we introduce cover crops, we start seeing totally different things. Here's a bean root, and and a annual ryegrass root, and an earthworm sharing the same channel. Did you guys see that ruler? How deep we are? And it kept right on going. I'm telling you, this is just where we took a good picture, but it kept right on going. What if we could create a path of least resistance, where we precision placed all the nutrients that you could possibly ever want to store in in, a, in one location? You know, we talk about right place, right time. That'd be the right place in August, in my opinion, to have my nutrients. But right where I know I've got created a path of least resistance, where, and we've placed those nutrients where we're absolutely sure our next crop's roots are going to grow. Not only grow, but get there very fast and very easy, especially if we haven't come in every year or every other year and disturbed this surface and cut off access to this. When you leave this, this channel open so that that crop, as soon as it emerges, comes right up and heads right down, those roots head right down those channels rapidly, those nutrient-rich channels, it's very, very advantageous once you build this system. Okay? 
Use what nature has provided. You look at down, all the way down, as far down into the soil, this is up in Jasper County, uh, on Larry Stroll's farm. I'm sorry to say, Larry was killed in an accident this year. It was a tremendous loss to the conservation community up there. Uh, but we had field days there at Larry's farm in Brook, Indiana, and Pitts, Dan uh, Perkins and I, we, we spent a lot of time looking at some of those pits, and I, I love going up there for Dan's field days where he does his pit digs and his cover crop digs, because we get to see what nature can, can produce in the way of rebuilding soil. You know, if, we, if, if land is worth $12,000 an acre, uh, maybe we should use more of it, okay? Maybe if we're gonna sp expand our operation, if we're trying to grow our operation, maybe we could expand it vertically also. And, and, and get just a, about as much economic benefit, okay? So that's what we're trying to do, building that resilience. Makes us drought resi resistant, okay? The thing about adding water, this, this occurred to me, we see it time and time again, but uh, Christine Nichols brought this to my attention this last winter. Uh, he said way a long time ago, now this says 2000, but this was a reissue of an earlier paper from William Albrecht, said that he did a, did a study years ago that, that showed that you can add four times as much water to irrigation, you can add four times as much water and still not achieve the yield that you've got with four times less water, but that water was nutrient rich. Okay, do you follow what I'm getting at? The crop is designed by nature to take nutrients up in solution. It's not just going for water. It may be, there may be a myth to the drought how much water that the crop needs if every drop it gets is coming from an area that is nutrient rich and nutrient balanced. The biology in that rhizosphere will do a tremendous job, all those microbes will do a, a tremendous job, along with the earthworms, of balancing that nutrient content of that soil around there so that, so that it's a very nutrient rich and very plant available, balanced diet of nutrients that as that crop root goes down for that water, it's getting a perfect solution of nutrients, okay? So there may be something to, maybe it's not just adding water is not the answer, but, but creating that alternate pathway where we can get at the water that has greater uh, uh, nutrient availability. Then porosity, and there, there's some other studies that, that we look at that, that shows how uh, porosity is so important to increasing infiltration. This is very important. This was, this was a slide that we used at an irrigation day. Because as we start thinking we're just going to pour water on it, what we found last year, you know, Ed Britton in that drought, he has irrigation in northern Putnam County. He says, my gosh, I couldn't even put more than a half an inch of water on it. It started running off. Even on pretty flat ground, it started running off. But the places where he had a really good system started, and really only three years of no-till on cover crops, he could get two, two inches of water, as much water as he wanted to get in the ground. So that's what this study showed a long time ago. Okay? So if we're going to convert to irrigation, getting that water in is going to be far more efficient for us also. Okay? Sometimes we use tillage to get a, the ground dried out in the spring of the year. Some of the vertical tillage tools to dry it out early in the year so that we can get planted. And that does generally give us a quicker jump out of the ground and that crop looks better early, as this did. Uh, but later in, right across the road, the field that had a no-till and a cover crop by late June was showing a lot less stress. It's the same, same field, okay? Got these out of, out of order, but these are right across the road from each, right down the road from each other. Same, similar soil, similar, of course, rainfall pattern. But by, by the end of June last summer, uh, we had fields that were really hurting. They came out of the ground and looked far better early. But, but then, then later in the, uh, uh, the season, uh, those crops finally, finally hit those alternate pathways that got down through the root channels and was accessing water later in the summer, okay? The thing that cover crops can do for us is help us provide another mode of action on our weed control. Uh, the field on the left was planted into cereal rye that was about this tall. 
and uh, it's a field where we have a tremendous problem with the uh, glyphosate resistant mare's tail in our part of the world. The neighbor that, that, that hit his field twice with a vertical tillage tool to try to knock some of those out in the spring of the year, they just didn't quite get it done because in many cases these were, they had all winter to grow and get established. They, they'll, they'll germinate and come up in the fall and through the spring, the early spring, so they're already there and pretty well established. But where there was a rye cover crop, they were having to compete with, a, you know, what rye is like but from a weed control standpoint. So it was having to compete with that rye. So this had a distinct advantage come spring. Uh, the other thing about this was we had extra water and, and we had extra growth that last spring when the water shut off, these beans were really suffering all year long. Uh, in a field, uh, a second field where the, the cereal rye was actually let go this tall, uh, there was absolutely, you could not find a single mare's tail in that field whatsoever. And that turned out to be the highest yielding field. That, that exceeded the, the normal county average by three bushels. In, in the worst drought on record, it exceeded the, the average county yield for, for average years, not just last year, but the average county yield. This one here, I'm not sure what the yield was. Uh, it, it might have made 20 bushels. But it looked like it was a big pillow fight going on down there when the harvester pulled in, when the combine pulled in, because anybody's not ever seen a field that's been taken over by mare's tail and it gets to full bloom, that's not pretty. I was kind of nervous because I was standing there looking right across the field and seeing it heading, heading, heading my way. Okay, so uh, weed control is another reason to, to think about using cover crops. It add, adds that layer of competition out there that might be a mode of action for us. Okay, so let's talk strategies. If you think that you want to maybe work towards something like this, a higher functioning soil, and you think you might want to consider some cover crops, there are management uh, problems that you want, to, you want to be able to address. One is you got to know what your next crop wants. If, if corn is your next crop, what's the number one thing it wants that you're worried about? Nitrogen. If you plant a cover crop, any old cover crop, but you pick cereal rye like wheat or, or a cereal grain like wheat, then what's the number one thing that that wheat wants? Nitrogen. Which one was the first feeder to the trough? The cover crop was, right? So you've planted something out there that's competing for the same resource in the spring of the year. We know through radioisotope studies that uh, of the nitrogen that you apply, we have a hard time getting much more than 50% of it to the crop. But that crop is still going to try to pull a lot of its nitrogen from the soil solution. If something else was already there pulling that nitrogen from the soil solution, what's your strategy then? If corn, if you know you're planting corn, what would be your strategy for this, for this situation if you were trying to go ahead and plant corn in this? What would be the first thing you do with that weed? Kill it early. Kill it in a vegetative state, and I'll show you the C to N ratios here in just a second, but kill it early in a vegetative state, it's higher in protein, it's going to break down fit faster, and it's going to at least release some of that nitrogen earlier. What's the next thing you're going to make sure you do in that, as you plant that corn? You're going to have to put starter nitrogen out there or an early form of nitrogen out there because who has the nitrogen, the soil nitrogen? The wheat does, right? So you're going to have to supplement early nitrogen. Now if you kill it early, it will, it will start mineralizing and it'll probably give that back. Okay, it's going to give it back now, right when you need it. So that's not all lost. It, it can finish really well. Okay? But you're going to have to supplement the early nitrogen. Okay? The other thing that you can do, a better strategy might be, what's this, corn after what? It looks like corn, but it, it's not corn. Uh, not as far as that corn crop that's growing knows. That corn crop thinks it's growing after a mix of poultry litter, annual ryegrass, and crimson clover. Okay? You can't see it because it's already broken back down and it's releasing nitrogen right back to that crop, and that's why that crop looks that good in a no-till corn after corn situation. Okay? No-till corn after corn has a lot to do with just managing carbon and nitrogen. You put a high protein cover crop, you feed it with some poultry litter, and, and, and you've got a high protein situation in the spring, and you kill it in its vegetative state, and you're gonna have really, really healthy corn, and really high, high production potential there. 
Anytime you can ahead of corn, you try to put together uh, a legume type cover crop, okay? Or something that's gonna make nitrogen or at least release nitrogen at a timely fashion for that corn crop. That's your strategy, okay? Uh, this past year, I was kind of worried. And so as we start thinking about, okay, well then when, are you, when am I gonna kill that cover crop? Back to this game time coach situation. So based on what I just told you, you see some cereal rye there. When would I want to kill that cereal rye? My, my next crop is going to be corn. Okay? What? Yellow. In the vegetative state. Kill it early, right? That's what I just spent a whole big long dissertation telling you to kill a cover crop early if you're going to have corn the next day. Okay? So here it comes this spring. This was pretty early. I threw that out there and I looked at it and I said, I could kill it today. Should I? I'm trying to be a game time coach. Should I? And some people did. Okay? And I'm not sure they hurt themselves from a yield standpoint, but what happened through the month of April? If this was killed, this was about the first week in April. What, what happened all through April? Not just a little bit of rain, right? It really, we got some. And it kept coming all through May. Okay, so I was like, oh my gosh, I could have killed it. There was not another single opportunity to kill that rye cover crop, knowing that this field was going to corn. Kept growing, kept growing. Whoops. Until finally, my next opportunity to kill this was right there. Now, is all lost at this point? Okay, it's now, it's now about the third week of May. But what else do you see growing down here? See anything else growing? You, you, you can't hardly see it here, right? But, but it's there. Here's what you see growing. So what I've got is a three-way mix left that's cereal rye, but there's Austrian winter pea and there's crimson clover. There was also oats and oilseed radish in the mix before it winter killed last fall. Now those, those two actually came up faster in the fall, provided some early winter cover for these other legume species down here, I think. Okay, so now you've got a mix like this, that yes, that rise a little taller than I would have wanted, but the good news is I've also let those legumes grow and they're fixing nitrogen and, and producing nitrogen. So now when I kill this, what am I killing? I'm killing a pretty high protein mix. What did we say we needed for corn? A lot of nitrogen. This is actually in the form of protein, which when will this become available to that crop? Most likely this year. Right now, actually the last month is when it's, it's really been kicking in and, and spoon feeding that late nitrogen for that crop. So as you plant into this, it looks a little scary, okay? So the timing was, and, and now that risk management is, uh, has changed our, our killing abilities, we can manage that as a good game time coach should. How would you, what would be your strategy as far as killing this? Would you spray it first, wait a week, then plant? Anybody done this? If it's this tall and you spray it and you wait a week, maybe you get a rain on it, anything happen there? Anybody ever planted through a big pile of rope? It's not fun, I'm just telling you. I got a lot of calls this year and that, and that was not something that anybody was having fun with. So the very best thing is, if you spray it today, plant it today. Now that we can manage the way we want to, I would plant first and spray tomorrow. Or tomorrow if I, could, I would make absolutely sure I could get killed right after I plant. But Plant first when it gets that tall and then spray because it's going to be easier to manage. If you do that, you still need starter fertilizer because that, that cover crop still has the early nitrogen in it. So you still have starter fertilizer. So then you get some pretty dark looking corn. And I'm just going to tell you that that's the corn that came from this field. And, and it's, it's mapped as highly erodible. In 1970 it was mapped as highly erodible. Uh, uh, and as you look at it at this growth stage, I don't think it's showing any nitrogen deficiency yet. Uh, 
when guys peeking out of there. I don't know. It, it, it it's, it's, looks like it's going to get all the nitrogen that it needs. Okay? So, from that strategy. Now, let me just talk here real quickly. I'll see if this works, and then we'll talk about how to... Just a, just a physics, a real quick physics thing on how to manage the termination and then how to plant into it. If you do kill a cover crop, something happens, you've killed it and it does turn to rope on you, getting that planter to cut through it, there, there are some issues that you need to understand. I'm simulating the soil surface with this, uh, this, this cover down here at the bottom, okay? And you see that black line? That's the soil surface, okay? So there's just some sheer physics on understanding that, that planter, how it's got to cut through rope. If you try to get that culture to cut through this, at this, at this depth, what, what's the situation you're going to have? Is it going to cut it very good at that cutting angle? It's just going to pinch it into the ground, right? The culture running in front is going to pinch it in a little bit, and then the cultures running behind are going to pinch it a little more, and you're going to hairpin all that residue right in the ground, right? Okay? So, being a game time coach, you're going to have to drop the depth just a little bit. And, and so that you've changed that cutting angle a lot so that now you've got an angle, you've got a much better chance to actually cut that residue and then hopefully the double disc openers as they cut and pull apart will, will finish it off. Now I'm going to suggest though that taking this culture completely off in some instances is going to be the far better thing because you've got a pretty good cutting angle right here. That's a pretty good cutting angle that you're planting, you know, inch and a half deep or maybe two inches deep. But keep in mind how that double disc opener works. You're not only cutting it, but it's at an angle, right? So it's cutting it, making a slice in that residue, and then popping it apart. Okay? So it actually has some physics working for it that actually helps you cut through residue better than a poultry by itself. Does that make sense? So when you're cutting through tough residue, you'll see a, a lot of no-till farmers that are, are using cover crops a lot have moved away from this, have moved away from a culture. Okay? So that's just it's a little physics lesson on when you're... It's not cutting. This isn't the same as, as, as just going into regular residue. Okay? All right. Strategically, do soybeans need... I'm going to jump way ahead here, though. Uh, We've talked about this. Understanding your C to N ratio is part of that nitrogen management that I was talking about. Just know that the more mature the cover crop gets, especially if it's a cereal grain, the higher the C to N. That means it's going to lock up nitrogen. That also means it's going to be tougher stuff to cut through. Okay, so, so if it's corn that you're growing, you want to be closer to this balanced microbial diet so we're not tying up nitrogen. So you want to kill that lye cover crop in its vegetative stage, or make sure there's legumes with it that actually puts that down here to where it's going to provide nitrogen. Okay? Real quick, then, here's the strategy that I would go if I was starting from scratch. Maybe I'm not even no-tilling. I'm a corn bean farmer. I would really like to change this uh, into uh, a more produce, a higher functioning soil. And so my very first operation that I would do is I would no-till cereal rye after corn. That would be my very first no-till operation. I'd either use uh, a, a, a vertical tillage tool that has a cedar on it uh, so that I can chop through those stalks because I haven't got the biology in place yet. Okay, so I might use that as my cedar first of all, or better yet, just go use a drill and drill right through those corn stalks, knock them down. I would hire myself a good scout. Uh, make sure I've got my management in place to, to keep track of anything that's different. Um, Lucy's good for about two voles each pass I take, so, so she's good to have with me. But have a good scout. Make sure you've got your management in place early on in the system. Go to meetings like this. Okay? First no-till operation is, is rock. Second no-till operation is going to be soybeans. The beauty of soybeans is it's so flexible. Yes, I'd probably kill my rye if it was that tall. If that was my, if the opportunity exists, that's when I'd probably kill it. But if I don't get it killed, it's a wet spring. Soybeans can be planted in a really tall rye with no real major penalty. Okay, I would try to plant an earlier group soybean, and I would plant that bean early. Why do I want an early bean out there? I, I want to have a wider window in the fall, exactly, because, because I want to have a better window in the fall to pick from more species of cover crops next fall that's going to be ahead of my corn. So, 
So I want to plant an early bean early. If I'm going to have an early bean, why do I plant it early? Because an early bean early, uh, it's a more determinate bean, so it's going to quit growing earlier in the year, so it's going to have to utilize moisture earlier in the season. Now the beauty of that system is, a lot of you say, well, I, I have to plant a full season bean to get all my full yield. An early bean early into this kind of cover. Keep in mind, you've got that extra inch of water. You've got extra water, you've got moisture retention, you've got cooler temperatures. Earlier beans do better in this environment. We get really good yields from early beans. So if that comes off early, here's my third no-till operation. It's a low carbon to nitrogen cover crop mix. Because my beans came off earlier, I can pick from more species. I'm going to have oats and radish or something. Here's, here's one of the guys that, that uses 15-inch row planter and plants different alternating species. This is, this is radish that's going to die, it's going to winter kill, it's going to leave the ground very warm, very loose, very mellow, and weed free, and that's going to be where you plant your corn the next year. This is, this is ryegrass and or uh, um, uh, crimson clover, maybe some Austrian winter pea in here that makes it like a biological side dress operation. <laughs> It's going to provide nitrogen nearby to that corn crop. Okay, that's a little complicated for uh, somebody just starting out. If you're a little nervous about this, there's nothing wrong with an oat, oat, oilseed radish combination that's going to be planted, takes up that extra nitrogen in the fall of the year, starts the biological processes. It's two totally different plants than the rest of the things that you're planting, so the biological diversity is starting to benefit you. It's going to hold back the winter annual weeds and you're going to have a really warm, dry seed bed to no-till your fourth operation. Your fourth no-till operation then becomes your no-till corn. Okay? So now you're planting your first no-till corn operation, which is your fourth no-till operation, into an already biologically active, got roots down, got the soil opened up, got things functioning. So you're going to expect your first no-till corn crop to be very successful. Okay, you're still going to have starter on your nitrate, on your planter and do some of the things that the good management about no-till, but you've got a system that has a chance now. You've, you've jump-started, you know, 200 years of tillage, you've jump-started and tried to get it going back so that you're going to be very successful, expects really high health from that operation. Okay, so I'm going to stop right there and uh, maybe I've got time for a question or two, but that's, that's the system that I would look at and kind of having a strategy as I, as, I, as I look at integrating, trying to move toward a system like this. Two. You guys are going to get off the over here. Uh, we do here, right here on the, on the university farm, they've got controlled drainage. The question was, do we do anything with controlled drainage? This is what I'm going to say about drainage in general. I have never seen in my entire career as much drainage that's gone on in the last five to ten years, right? That goes to show you my very first opening comments that the farm economy is pretty stable, it's pretty good. Guys are willing to make some investments and drainage is a very important investment. That being said, we probably have the technology today to do so much smarter drainage than we're probably doing in a lot of cases. You know, if I was putting in a drainage system today, I'd be putting it out there kind of on a contour where you would have the ability, should you ever want to, to, to block that, to hold water back, and maybe even pump water back up through that system if you had to. We're putting in all this effort and all this tubing in the ground that probably could be put in like, under today's farm economy in a far smarter method than, than many of us are doing. And I don't mean to offend anybody, but I think we could. But you're holding the knife. You're holding the nitrogen back. Yeah, you're, you're keeping it on the farm. And that's, that's, that's what we need to be doing. That's part of this overall system. We, you know, we can do so much here, but there's always going to be a time that you know, if this whole system's drained and, and got drainage underneath it, it's, it can't do everything. If you wanted to put the total, total package together, you would have a drainage system with what I would call a, a, a more intelligent drainage system where we can manage water coming and going. And, and keep those nutrients on the farm uh, uh, a little better. That would be very, very advantageous for us. Any other questions? Well, 
question is putting putting those nutrients down through that rhizosphere, putting putting it down along that 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 root channel and that root path. And so the other part of, of you know, a good strategy for four R's that we hear about a lot is through strip tail system where we're putting our nutrients in its most efficient location right here. I guess I'm still a pretty good fan of strip tail one because I can do a better job of the four R's. I can put that nutrient, all those nutrients, right where they most likely need to be uh, placed. And we're doing that at a time as the biology in the system is on the going to sleep mode, right? We would do we would want to do that as the soil temperatures are falling. We're doing it in a very narrow band. I don't like to see strip till that's a huge operation. I think just do it as minimal as you possibly can to raise that soil a little bit and then do as little disturbance at a time of the year when we're we're we've got biology dropping in the soil. So we're with that disturbance at that time is far less uh, detrimental to the overall biology than it would be in the spring when it's all waking up and it's all getting ready to kick in here. Follow me? So I'm, I, I, I'm, I talk more about no-till, but in this part of the world I understand that strip-till has many of those same advantages and I kind of put them in the same category up here, especially if strip-till is done in a responsible manner and some of the better manners to, to minimize disturbance. <laughs>